Uh, good evening, uh, everyone, and um, much welcome to this midweek service, even as we feast on the gospel together from Proverbs chapter 13. Before we start this evening, I would uh, lead us in prayer, and then we'll dive into Proverbs chapter 13. Let's pray. Speak to us, O Lord, as we come to you this evening to feed from your word. We pray that, Lord, you would speak to each one of us gathered here on this midweek service. We pray especially that you would teach us from your word, from these proverbs that we have just read this evening. Thank you that this is your word. We pray that through it we will be drawn to love Jesus, to cherish him beyond and above everything else. We pray especially that you would help us to be those who would heed to what your word tells us. Please help us that will be those to, who listen to the instructions and to what your word calls us to do. We pray that you would speak to each one of us. For this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. This is indeed the word of the Lord. Uh, I wonder as we read through these proverbs, what comes to mind as you listen through to each one of them? I wonder whether you felt as we uh, read one, one of each or each of these proverbs, whether you did feel like each of these proverbs calls us to do something. In fact, it seems like each of these proverbs calls us to choose one option over another. It's kind of a, a choice of A instead of B. They call us to make a choice between two choices that are well presented to us. And as we'll see through this chapter, this chapter is just a call for each one of us here this evening to choose wisely. It's a call for each one of us here to choose wisely. Now, as a way of introduction, I wonder how many here do remember a very famous program that used to be aired in KBC. They call it uh, Kenya's number one station. But this program used to be aired many years ago. In fact, uh, um, I think when I was very young, it's uh, around 90s, and this program was called Omo Pick a Box. I don't know whether many of you would remember that program. During this show, people would be given a chance to choose between two things. You either choose money or you choose a box. It was a call to choose between two things, money or a box. The fun of this show was particularly on what each contestant would end up picking. Sometimes I would pick a very little cash that they'll give you, and then that may, would mean you will forfeit a very good prize, like a car that would be in the box. Of course, the car can't fit in the box, so there will be a key inside the box. I think one that I, I remember very clearly was when one person was being told to choose 30,000 shillings, so they will tell you the amount of money they are giving you, but they won't tell you what is inside the box. And he refused to pick that 30,000 that they had given, only to find in the box a sieve. <laughs> and then he had forfeited 30,000 shillings. Now, as we dive into Proverbs 13 this evening, it's clear that these Proverbs encourage us to choose. Yes, it's not a trick. Everything is given and no surprises are to be expected. We have for sure two ways to choose. We have two ways to choose. That's how we have been calling this um, uh, series. It's called Two Ways to Live, even as we hear the gospel from the book of Proverbs. As you can clearly see from that image, there are two ways to live. And exactly... Proverbs chapter 13 calls us to choose between two things. As we dive into these Proverbs, we can see that these Proverbs gives us two options to choose from. If you like, there are two ways that are given. There is the way of the righteous, and there is the, the way of the wicked. And both of these are put before us, just as they would do, or the contest, contestants of that program, a pick a box will be given, a box or money. 
And here we are given two ways to choose from. The way of the wicked or the way of the righteous. Both of these are put before us to choose from. It's a call for us to choose wisely. And the big question for us this evening will be, will we choose wisely? Will we choose the way of righteousness over the way of wickedness? Will we listen to the call of wisdom or will we listen to the call of folly? What will you and I choose? Now, looking at this chapter, we clearly see the main thing, or if you like the main um, theme of this passage that have just been read to us is wisdom calls us to avoid the way of wickedness and to follow the way of righteousness. Wisdom calls us to avoid the way of wickedness and follow the way of righteousness. Yes, it's clear from each of these proverbs in this chapter that what is commended here for you and I is the way of righteousness. You and I, we who are Christians here this evening, we are called to follow the way of righteousness. It's true that we are called to avoid the way of wickedness and choose and follow the way of righteousness. And we are to do this because wisdom avoids the way of wickedness and follows the way of righteousness. Wisdom avoids the way of wickedness and follows the way of righteousness. And just as verse 1 calls us to do, even as the writer of Proverbs would call his son to do, we are called to listen. We are called to heed to the call of wisdom. We are to listen to the call of wisdom to avoid the way of wickedness and to follow the way of righteousness. And as we see in these um, Proverbs, or in this chapter, we are to do this in four specific areas. In verses 2 to 6, wisdom calls us to avoid the way of wickedness and follow the way of righteousness in our speech. That is verses 2 to 6. Then look in verses 7 to 11. Wisdom calls us to avoid the way of wickedness and follow the way of righteousness in the way we do or think about our wealth. Then verses 12 to 19, the way we think about our longings and our desires. And then we'll finish there lastly by seeing how verse 20 to 25, the wisdom calls us to avoid the way of wickedness and to follow the way of righteousness, even as we think of our destiny. So four different areas or four different things that this chapter calls us to think, even as we think about this call of wisdom to avoid the way of wickedness and to follow the way of righteousness. So what we'll do this evening is just look at for this, uh, these four different things and then go through each one of them one by one. So first, on speech. Wisdom calls us to avoid the way of wickedness in the way we use our speech and to follow the way of righteousness. Verses 2 to 6. Let me read this uh, Proverbs again, even as we look them through. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 2, the Bible says, From the fruit of his mouth a man eats what is good, but the desire of the treacherous is for violence. Whoever guards his mouth pres preserves his life. He who opens wide his lips comes to ruin. The soul of the sluggard craves and gets nothing, while the soul of the diligent is literally supplied. The righteous hates falsehood, but the wicked brings shame and disgrace. Righteousness guards him whose way is blameless, but sin overthrows the wicked. As you can see from these five proverbs, that is verses 2 to 6, we see here Solomon saying that wisdom advises caution in the way we use our speech. To put it differently, wisdom calls us to be careful in the way we use our mouth. In fact, in verses 2 and 3, Solomon uses two images to illustrate how we use our mouth or how we use our speech. Do you see how he starts there in verse 2 in saying that good speech is like a fruit? Good speech is like a fruit which is a source of nourishment for those 
who hear it. Those who follow wisdom, that is, those who go in the path of righteousness, will nourish all who hear them. Just as a good fruit, an apple or an orange or a mango, nourish is the one who eats it. But do you see what will happen to those who follow that path of wickedness? No one will want to listen to them. For what comes out of their mouth, Solomon says, is violence. No wonder wisdom calls us to avoid the way of wickedness and to follow the way of righteousness in the way we use our mouth or in the way we use our speech. The other image he uses there in verse 3 is an image of a mouth being like a gate. Solomon says that whoever guards his mouth, like one who do guard a gate, you know those soldiers that stand on the gate? Whoever does that, Solomon says, he protects his life. But the vice versa is also true. A fool opens his mouth wide. And when you leave gates open, what happens? Disaster enters in. And once disaster gets in, the aid is ruined. And this is because verse 5, the wicked loves a deceitful word and will be ashamed, brings shame and disgrace. Two very helpful images there. Like a fruit that nourishes if you speak or follow the way of righteousness. But if you follow the way of wickedness, it's just like an open gate that allows wickedness in and disaster. Here, the light of Proverbs, who is Solomon, calls us to see two ways to live. We either choose to follow wisdom in the way of righteousness, or we choose to follow folly in the way of wickedness. And please note that the reward for the way we choose is well presented there in verse 6. Verse 6 says, Righteousness guards him whose way is blameless, but sin overthrows the wicked. Righteousness, we clearly see here, protects. But on the other hand, wickedness destroys. In other words, the eternal destinies of both of these ways that we are going to choose from are well presented. When we choose in our speech to follow the way of the wicked, the end is ruin. The end is destruction. On the other hand, if we choose the way of righteousness, there is protection and preservation of life. And the big question for us here tonight, as we have been seen from Proverbs so far, is which way will you and I take? Concerning our speech, which way will you and I take? Will we take the way of wickedness and be like that open gate that allows anything in? Or will we be like a fruit that when someone eats it, gets nourished? Will our outmark, uh, outcome be ruin and destruction? Or will our outcome be protection and life in the way we use our mouth and in the way we use our speech? Wisdom avoids the way of wickedness. Wisdom avoids the way of wickedness and follows the way of righteousness. Because once you follow the way of righteousness, the end is protection and life. It's worth mentioning here that the Bible clearly calls us to choose righteousness, even in our use of our speech. And, you, and I can only be able to do so because as followers of Jesus, as Christians, those who are in Christ, we have a model in Jesus Christ who the Bible tells us that he never sinned with his mouth and in his speech. In 1 Peter, or in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 22, we read that Jesus committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. 
Though he was tested in every way as we are, he never opened his mouth wide. He never let his mouth be like that open gate. But rather, even when he was tempted, just as we are, he committed no sin. And Peter tells us that no deceit was found in his mouth. His speech was pure. His life was marked with righteousness. And you and I here this evening, we are called to emulate him. We are called to emulate him in every way, in our use of our mouth and in the use of our speech. And our prayer should be that you and I will be found faithful in our use of mouth and speech. When Jesus appears, we will not be ashamed and shrink away from him with shame when he appears in regard to the way we use our mouth and in the regard the way we use our speech. Wisdom avoids the way of wickedness in the use of our speech and follows the way of righteousness. Besides speech, we are also called to follow the path of righteousness in our thinking about our world, which takes us to the second thing that we see here in this chapter. And that is the way we use or think about our world, verses 7 all the way to verses 11. Proverbs, as we have already seen in the previous chapters, have a, have a lot to talk about and say about wealth. And verses 7 to 11 that we are uh, before us uh, this evening here clearly does tell us something to do with wealth. Let me read them and please look, read me them with me as I go through them and see whether you can see what this Proverbs tells us about wealth. Verse 7. One pretends to be rich yet has nothing. Another pretends to be poor yet has great wealth. The ransom of a, of a man's life is his wealth, but a poor man he has no threat. The light of the righteous rejoices, but the lamp of the wicked will be out. By insolence comes nothing but strife, but with those who take advice is wisdom. Wealth gained history will dwindle, but whoever, whoever gathers little by little will increase it. You see, the temptation for us, and for many of us here this evening, is to think of wealth mostly in material terms. But as verse 7 tells us here, wealth is more than just having material stuff or material physical things. And this is clear in that there are those who may have a lot of material, physical material, and feel rich or think of themselves rich. But in spiritual terms, they have nothing. Look at me, with me, again in verse 7. One pretends to be rich, yet has nothing. Another pretends to be poor, yet has great wealth. On one hand, there are those who may have a lot of material, and they feel rich, and they think themselves rich. But as the Bible tells us somewhere else, in spiritual terms... These people have nothing. On the other hand, there are those who seem to be poor in that they have no material possessions. They cannot be featured in top 10 wealthiest people in this country or here in Kikuyu or in Kiabu County or whichever county you are. And yet, spiritually, they have great wealth. I think for the second case of these people, that is those who seem to be poor in that they have no material possessions or many material possessions and yet spiritually they have greater wealth, will be those who follow wisdom in the path of righteousness. It's true, they may seem to be poor, but in reality, this verse tells us they have great wealth. And this great wealth may consist in unmaterial values such as their fellowship with God, their satisfaction in Him, and in the circumstances that God has put them. You see, 
when the world think of themselves on their salvation and joy is found in what they own, the poor, you don't really think of them in the terms of their trust in God, which is greater in itself than many material possessions. The truth is, brothers and sisters, our worth is not in what we own, as one famous hymn puts it. Yes, you and I ought to remind ourselves this again and again, that my worth and your worth is not in what you and I own. Because riches are not an indication of our status and even of our worth or value. And as we clearly see here in verse 7, appearances can be deceiving. One pretends to be rich yet has nothing. Another pretends to be poor yet has great wealth. And as verse 8 shows, riches are not guarantee of our safety. The ransom of a man's life is his wealth, but a poor man, he has no threat. If we think that material wealth will be our safety, it doesn't guarantee our safety at all. And riches are not guarantee of our safety because verse 9, the wicked, that is those who amass a lot of wealth quickly and in illegal ways, will have their lamp put out sooner than they think. In other words, their material possession and wealth won't help them in their time of need. On that last day, when the trumpet call will sound, their material health, wealth will not help them. Those who have amassed a lot, lot, lots of wealth quickly and in illegal ways will have their lamp put out sooner than they think. On the other hand, those who, as verse 11 tells us, those who will gather little by little, those who will work and labor, in most cases, they will end up enjoying a long and a happy life. In fact, verse 11 tells us, well, gain, gained history will dwindle, but whoever gathers little by little will increase it. And those who are able to do so, to gather little by little, are only those who follow wisdom in the way of righteousness and those who avoid the way of wickedness, gaining wealth too quickly in means that sometimes do not even glorify God. Verse 11 says, those who follow folly in the way of wickedness, in amassing wealth too quickly, that wealth will dwindle. It will fly away. I don't know whether most of us here have come across that report that was produced some time back that showed that many young people here in Kenya want to get rich. By the age of 30 or 35, and they really don't care the means to get rich as long as they get rich. It's a sad survey indeed, which showed that many Kenyan youth today say they want to become rich, but most of them don't want to work hard or to study or to use legal and the right means to get rich. Many, we know them. Even as I say this, some of you would start thinking of people who are involved in dubious way of getting rich. They just want to get rich, no matter the means. The means doesn't matter as long as I get rich. It's important to read verse 11 again and let it sink in for a while. First, Verse 11 says, the wealth that is gotten in a hurry and in a rush will dwindle. It will disappear like mist and like vapor into thin air. Let me read it again and let this sink in. One of the beauty of reading Proverbs, especially this section that we are in, that is from chapters 10 all the way to chapter 29, 
is that each of these phrases or each of these proverbs helps us to slow down and reflect on what they say. Verse 11 says, Wealth gained history will dwindle, but whoever gathers little by little will increase it. Money, wealth, possessions that are gained quickly, in a hurry, in a rush. The Bible tells us, or Solomon says, as he writes these proverbs, that these will disappear quickly, just as they quickly come. But in contrast, those who follow the way of righteousness, they work hard, they labor to get and to earn and to make a living. What they gather, little by little, will increase. A very good, in, I think, reminder for each one of us here this evening from God's word that our worth is not in what we own, but our worth is in something totally different. It's good to think about wealth. And even as a Christian, you can't think you can't think of wealth and not think about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, whom the Bible in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 verse 9 tells us that though he was rich, yet for our sake Jesus became poor so that we through his poverty might become rich. A very profound verse here to think about even as we think about wealth. Jesus, though he was rich, he became poor so that you and I, we who are in him, we who are in him, who is the true wisdom of God, can become rich. Of course, it's worth saying material wealth and possessions do matter. The Bible does talk about wealth in positive terms. But as we see in this verse of 2 Corinthians chapter 8 verse 8 and 9, chapter 8 verse 9, the Bible clearly makes it clear that what really matters is whether we have become rich before the eyes of God. That Jesus, though he was rich, he became poor so that you and I, we who are in him, can become rich. And the truth is, you and I, we who are here this evening, are poor. In fact, Jesus somewhere else uh, speaking to his disciples on the Sermon on the, mountain, uh, on the Mount calls them to be poor in spirit. And it's to such, those who are poor in spirit, that Jesus came to. Jesus himself, writing to one of the seven churches in Revelation, specifically the church of Laodicea, he tells them this in Revelation chapter 3, verse 17. You say, that's what they used to say, I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not be, need a big thing. But you do not realize, Jesus tells them, you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. This is the way to think about riches and poverty. It's to such who are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked that Jesus came to. It is to such that Jesus, though rich, became poor so that we, through his poverty, might become rich. This is the richness that really matters. And this is what following the path of wisdom gives. This is what seeking righteousness looks like. Seeing Jesus as the one who makes us to become rich in the eyes of God. Now, besides speech and wealth, another area that this chapter calls us to follow wisdom is in the way of righteousness and in avoiding wickedness is in the area of our longings and desires. That is verses 12 to 19. Here in these verses, we find the third area where we are to follow the way of righteousness is in our longings and in our desires. 
we clearly see, looking at verses 12 and verses 19, a repetition of the words, desire fulfilled. Let me read these two verses, which brackets this section. Verse 12, the Bible says, Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a desire fulfilled is a plea of life. Verse 19 says, A desire fulfilled is sweet to the soul, but to turn away from evil is an abomination to the fools. Desire fulfilled, in these two verses clearly, associates our hopes and our dreams with the benefits of wisdom. I'm sure most of us here this evening have longings and desires of our hearts. This verse clearly shows us that following wisdom in the path of righteousness leads to fulfillment of our desires. And that in itself is a good thing. In fact, verses 13 to 15 goes on to say that hidden wisdom leads to rewards and life. But on the other hand, he who follows folly on the path of wickedness, what comes to them is destruction and death and ruin. Not heeding to wisdom's call to avoid wickedness, heeding to folly's call to the way of wickedness results in death and destruction and ruin. In fact, looking at verse 18, we see that those who ignore instruction, poverty and disgrace come to them. In other words, their longings and their desires are never fulfilled. But for those who follow wisdom, those who heed to instruction and reproof, they are honored and their desires are fulfilled. And as verse 19 would say, a desire fulfilled is sweet to the soul. It is sweet to the soul of the righteous. That is, the righteous experience the present joy of having our desires fulfilled. But on the other hand, we are told that fools, that is those who do not heed to wisdom, they never find their longings and desires fulfilled. And as we have already said or seen in this study of Proverbs, this series of two ways to live, our desire as Christians ought to be in Jesus. In fact, our desire can only be found in Jesus, whom the Bible tells us is our wisdom. For you and I to have to say that our longing as desires are fulfilled, as these Proverbs tell us, that can only happen if we have Jesus in our lives. And as Christians, we thus can heed to the call of the writer of Hebrews, who tells us in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and the perfecter of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despite, despising the shame, and is now seated at the right hand of the throne of God. He ought to be our longing to run the race with endurance. Look into Jesus, knowing that our longings and our desires will be ultimately fulfilled when we see Jesus face to face. If we follow the call of wisdom to avoid the way of wickedness, the truth is, the way of righteousness will lead us one day to our longings and to our desires to see Jesus face to face. To be with him days without end. To be the one with the one who is the founder and the perfect of our faith. This is because wisdom avoids the way of wickedness and follows the way of righteousness, which means we, we see our desires and longings fulfilled. Now, in the remaining verses, the fourth and the first thing that we see in these Proverbs that you and I ought to heed to the wisdom's call in following the path of righteousness 
is regarding our destiny, which is the last thing that we want to see together in these uh, remaining verses. So verses 20 to 25, it's on the issue of our destiny. Let me read these five verses, even as we near to the end. Verse 20 says, Whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. Disaster pursues sinners, but the righteous are rewarded with good. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children, but the sinner's wealth is laid up for the righteous. The furrow ground of the poor will yield much food, but it's swept away through injustice. Whoever spares the road hates his son, but he who loves him is diligent to discipline him. The righteous has enough to satisfy his appetite, but the berry of the wicked suffers want. In this first, uh, last five proverbs of this chapter, the great emphasis is on destiny. In verse 20, Solomon notes that whoever walks with the wise, his or her destiny is well known by everyone. And the vice versa, he says, is also true. Whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. In other words, Solomon is saying that an association with wisdom will get one to a destiny, and the company of fools will also get you to another destination. Here are two ways to live, well laid out for us. You either choose wisdom and walk in the walk path of righteousness, or you choose folly and walk in the way of wickedness. Whichever you choose, be sure that your destination is well put forward and made clear. Then in verse 21, we are told that what awaits sinners, that is those who chose the way of wickedness, is nothing else but disaster. Verse 21, disaster pursues sinners. Then in verse 21, we also given another destination. The righteous, we are told, are rewarded with good. Those who eat to the call of wisdom to follow the path of righteousness, their reward is good. In fact, looking at verses 22 to 24, we keep seeing the emphasis on the outcomes of those who follow the way of righteousness and those who follow the way of wickedness. Verse 22 says that a righteous man lives an inheritance generations. But that is not so with the wicked. Like in the parable of talents that Jesus gave, who even the wicked people, the little that they have will also be taken away from them and be given to the righteous. One of us 22 says, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children, but the sinner's wealth is laid up for the righteous. He'll be added to the righteous. Verse 23 says something that's quite interesting. In fact, it goes ahead to say what happens now in the world that we live in, but ought not to happen. When we look around, we see a lot of injustices happening to the righteous. The furrow ground of the poor will yield much food, but it's swept away through injustice. This is not what ought to happen. But it's what we see when we look around. But even in the midst of such life, we know that the destiny of the wicked is known. Their aid, when they carry out injustices now and here, their aid is disaster and harm. And no wonder in verse 24, parents are told, if they spare the rod and hate their son, then what will mean to them is the head of their son, is destruction and ruin. And the head result, as verse 25 highlights, is that the righteous will be contented in all they do as they follow the path or the way of wisdom. Which won't be the case for those who follow in the way of wickedness. Their berry will always suffer want. They can't get enough. As we think of our destiny, we can't help think, brothers and sisters, of what Jesus himself says as he talks about why he came. In John chapter 10, verse 10, here Jesus promises a destiny to all who will follow him. 
He who is the wisdom of God. He says in John 10 verse 10 that the thief comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy. But he says he came so that those who will believe in him, their destiny will be life. And they will have that life to the full. Clearly, you know what Jesus says here? He says he came to those that will believe in him so that their destiny will not be death and destruction and ruin, as these Proverbs would tell us, but their destination will be to have life and to have it in full. So, as I finish, the big question for you and I this evening is, which way will we choose? We do listen to wisdom's call to avoid wickedness and to choose and follow the way of righteousness which leads to eternal life that Jesus he himself says in John 10.10 10, that he offers or would you and I prefer for his call to choose the way of wickedness which the end and the destiny is destruction. Here are two ways to live for you and I. Which way will you choose? Will you choose righteousness or wickedness? Will you choose eternal life or will you choose eternal death as your destiny? May the Lord help each one of us here, especially if you are not a Christian, to know that the way of wickedness leads to destruction and death and ruin, as these proverbs would tell us. But for those who have chosen the way of wisdom and the path of righteousness, their aid is life. And that life is that Jesus came to bring, which he says, he came, that you and I may have life and have it in full. May the Lord help us this evening. God bless you. Thank you for listening.